Thank you very much. These are unusual times, and uh, getting used to a mask is one of the things that has been a challenge, especially when I put my glasses on as they fog up. I'm sure everyone's got the same experience. I'm going to be speaking to you today about Benjamin Lett, an early Canadian terrorist, and uh, someone to whom I'm distantly related to. So it's a bit of a family history thing here as well. In the early hours of Good Friday, April 17, 1840, a terrific explosion shattered the peaceful atmosphere of the village of Queenston in Upper Canada. Brock's Monument, burial place of General Sir Isaac Brock, the much revered hero of the War of 1812, was in ruins. Immediately, Benjamin Lett, an Irish Canadian rebel, was accused of engineering the violent act. So what was Benjamin Lett? In 1798, one of Ireland's many rebellions against the English was more like a civil war. United Irishmen, Catholics, and Presbyterians rose up in several counties in a failed attempt to drive the English out and make Ireland independent. Many families were split with some members joining the rebels, while others fought for the crown to crush the rebellion. The rebellion was particularly divisive in County Wexford, and members of the Warren and Lett families were found on both sides of the struggle. There were rebel victories at Enniscorthy on May 28th, uh, 18, 1798, Wexford Town on May 30th, 1798, but a devastating loss at New Ross on June 5th, 1798. The final action was at Vinegar Hill on June 21st, 1798, when the rebels, known to the English as crappies, armed with scythes, pitchforks, and pikes, were mown down by English artillery. According to oral tradition, 11-year-old Elizabeth Warren was molested and her brother Benjamin lynched by Irish yeomen, militiamen loyal to Britain during this uprising. Another brother, William, was killed at the Battle of Vinegar Hill or shortly thereafter. Elizabeth married Samuel Lett of County Wexford, one of the so-called Black Letts. Together they had six children, including Benjamin, born on November 14, 1813. Elizabeth Lett had developed a great hatred for sectarian violence and for the local militia officers who condoned excesses of behavior during the uprising in Wexford. This hatred would be passed on to young Benjamin in spades. In 1819, the Lett family emigrated, settling in Chatham Township, Lower Canada, in Quebec, a few miles, uh, ironically, from Dalesville. Some of my ancestors had settled. Five years later, Samuel was killed in a farming accident, leaving Elizabeth alone to run the farm and raise her young family. In 1833, she moved the family to Darlington, Upper Canada. Benjamin was working on his mother's farm when rebellion broke out in Upper and Lower Canada in 1837. William Lyon Mackenzie had started the rebellion in Upper Canada with a failed attempt to capture Toronto's armory in early December. Mackenzie fled to the United States and then invaded Navy Island in the Niagara River, proclaiming the Republic of Upper Canada at Navy Island on December 14, 1837. It is likely that Benjamin sympathized with the rebels, but took no active role in 1837. In Darlington, members of the local Loyal Orange Lodge, a right-wing anti-Catholic pro-British institution, had mustered to root out suspected rebel sympathizers in the area. The Orangemen persecuted the Lett family because the men would not actively join the organization or enroll for active duty in the local militia. Something in Benjamin snapped. He left home to join Mackenzie's rebel, island, uh, rebel army on Navy Island. On Navy Island, the rebels dug trenches and cannon emplacements to defend against a possible British attack. Supplies and reinforcements came from Buffalo, New York, ferried to Navy Island by the steamer Caroline. On December 29th, a small Canadian force under the command of Royal Navy Captain Andrew Drew captured the Caroline at Buffalo, set it on fire, and cut it loose to plunge over Niagara Falls. A week later, militia artillery began a 10-day bombardment of Navy Island, finally forcing the rebels to retreat. 
Lett was wounded, but not severely, during the bombardment. Rebel forces invaded elsewhere and were defeated at the battles of Fighting Island and Pelee Island near Windsor in February and March 1838. Lett was involved in both actions and must have shared the frustration of continuing failure of armed military-style actions. This frustration led Lett to undertake a series of individual acts of terrorism. On May 29, 1838, rebels burned the steamer of Sir Robert Peel in the St. Lawrence River in revenge for the burning of the Caroline. Lett may have been part of the rebel force under the pirate Bill Johnson who burned the Sir Robert Peel. Bill Johnson was an infamous smuggler in the Thousand Islands of the St. Lawrence River and had been active uh, well before the rebellion and naturally joined Mackenzie's rebellion once the rebellion broke out. He uh, ended up on Navy Island, where uh, Lett undoubtedly met him, and uh, Bill Johnson was, was labeled the Pirate of the Thousand Islands, but uh, also was created the Commodore of the Rebel Navy, of which there was none. <laughs> the Rebel Navy consisted of Bill Johnson's rowboats that he used uh, to, to prey on merchants in, in the St. Lawrence River. In any case, case the uh, Sir Robert Peel was was burned, and uh, the method of setting it on fire kind of rings a bell. They put a trunk on board filled with combustibles and gunpowder with a fuse, lit the fuse, got off the boat, and uh, a fire was started, and it, it burned to the gunnels. Uh, the type of fuse that was used was uh, sort of the 19th century version of a, of a time bomb. You simply took some quick, quick fuse, um, you know, that, that, that burned very quickly and exploded gun, a gunpowder charge, and you tied it around a candle at the appropriate point and lit the candle. So it could be two hours later when the flame burned down to the fuse, or it could be half an hour later, or whatever. Quite clever when you think of it. So no ticking time bombs, uh, you know, with a with an old alarm clock, but uh, but simply a fuse on a candle. <coughs> the Coburg Star described Lit at this time as being five foot eleven inches high, so he was fairly tall for the time, rather slim. Sandy hair and whiskers, very red-faced and freckled, light-skinned, very large muscular hands with round, long, and very white fingers, eyes light blue and remarkably penetrating. Reportedly, he carried four pistols and a bowie knife wherever he went, so he was very well armed. Militia Captain Edgeworth Usher, who had been one of the participants in the Caroline incident, became the target of Lett's first act of terrorism on his own. Usher was living uh, just on the other side of Chippewa, uh, alongside what's now known as Streets Creek, but at that time was known as Usher Creek. On the night of November 16, 1838, Lett crossed from Buffalo and shot Usher on his own doorstep near the village of Chippewa, for Canada. The murder caused a great deal of outrage. Apparently, Lett had just shown up on the door, rapped on the door. It was answered. He asked to speak to Colonel Usher. Colonel Usher came to the door, and Lett shot him in the heart. Uh, pretty dastardly. On December 4, 1838, a band of about 160 hunters and patriots. The hunters were American sympathizers to the the uh, Patriots, or the Rebels of 1837-38. And the reason they got the name Hunters was that New York State kind of uh, turned a blind eye towards these large gatherings of armed men. And uh, when the local sheriffs questioned these men, and there might be 50 of them all wear well armed, some of them hauling cannon and that sort of thing, when they were questioned by the authorities of what they were up to, they would say they were going hunting. Well, no one hunts with a cannon, I hope. <laughs> and uh, so they, they gave the name the Patriot Hunters. So they were supporters of the, of the rebels during the rebellion. And actually, 
um, the prime actors in a lot of the little invasions of Upper Canada that continually fail. On December 4, 1838, a band of about 160 hunters and patriots crossed from the Detroit before dawn, occupying the village of Sandwich, now part of Windsor. Local militia mustered, and the rebels were finally defeated. Local militia captain John Prince summarily executed five of the captured prisoners who had been taken by the militia. This incident enraged Lett, who stepped up his reign of terror. Lett was suspected of plotting to destroy the British Lake Ontario fleet in Kingston Harbour in January 1839, when the fleet would have been frozen into the ice of the St. Lawrence River. The idea was the ships were all docked, basically very close together, but entombed in ice in the St. Lawrence, and all you needed to do was set one ship afire uh, upwind of the rest, and it would presumably burn the whole fleet. Well, it was unsuccessful. Uh, and we're not entirely sure that Benjamin Lett was involved in it or not. More on that uh, a little bit later. Uh, he was also accused of launching a failed raid on Colberg in June 1839 to kidnap prominent citizens who had also been involved in the burning of the Caroline back in January 1838. Lett seems to have lain low for a year, that there are no actions or, or acts of terrorism that I can find attributed to him from the time he was accused of um, the raid on Colberg in June through to uh, the, the following year. Well, on the run, sought by British and American authorities and dogged by bounty hunters, let set the bomb that irreparably destroyed Box Monument on Good Friday, April 17, 1840. Although Bach was uh, considered a saint by the loyalists of Upper Canada, Lett viewed this monument as a symbol of the Tory militia and of British rule. It made an ideal target for vengeance. He had been brought up by his mother, Elizabeth Warren Lett, to absolutely despise the English and to absolutely despise these uh, militia officers uh, who Ben Lett undoubtedly saw as the same as the yeomanry of Ireland who had devastated Elizabeth's uh, family when she was a young girl. It would take 13 years before work could begin on a new monument to replace that destroyed by lead. Lieutenant Governor Sir George Arthur offered a 500 pound reward, the equivalent of roughly $120,000 of uh, Canadian money today, for the apprehension of lead who had gained notoriety by this time as the Rob Roy of Upper Canada, always prowling about our frontier, devising and committing all manner of mischief. Many outrages in Upper Canada were blamed on Lent, including, I understand, thanks to Elizabeth, um, an attempt to burn Willowbank. I had never heard of this before. And... Uh, Actually, I think it rather unlikely. I can't think of any reason why Benjamin Lett would want to burn Willowbank. But um, we'll have to look into that a little bit more. On June 5th, 1840, Lett was in Oswego, New York, and was arrested for the attempted destruction of the Canadian steamer Great Britain after an incendiary bomb was set off prematurely aboard that vessel. It's the same type of bomb, a steamer trunk filled with combustibles and gunpowder and so on. But it didn't quite fit uh, Lett's uh, M.O. He, he normally struck at night. It was unusual for him to strike in, in daytime. This was a trunk that was placed outside the ladies' cabin on the, cab, uh, cabin on the SS Great Britain. Uh, Lett's M.O. as well involved getting all the passengers off the ship before setting it on fire. So he may or may not have been involved in that incident. But one of uh, the conspirators turned state evidence and uh, put the thumb on, on Benjamin Lent. So he was uh, arrested and tried and sentenced on June 25th to seven years hard labor in the state prison in Auburn, New York. Ironically, Lett was tried and sentenced for the one act of terrorism 
concerning which he was quite possibly innocent. En route to our let leaped from the train, though shackled, and evaded recapture by hiding in a swamp. He remained at large for the next 15 months. At 11 p.m. on September 9, 1841, the peace of the little village of Allenburg was shattered by two explosions. Gunpowder charges had been set off at the upper two locks of the Welling Canal at Allenburg. One lock gate was totally destroyed, but was quickly replaced by a spare gate stored nearby. The canal was fully operational the following day, so not a very effective uh, feat of terrorism, I suppose. This outrage was blamed on Benjamin Lett, and an additional bounty of 100 pounds placed on his head. If Lett was the perpetrator, it would be his last act of terrorism. In September 1841, after the bombing of the Welling Canal, Lett was in Buffalo, where he was recognized and seized by the authorities. He was taken to Auburn Prison to serve the sentence imposed 15 months earlier. Behind bars, Lett's health failed. By 1845, a lung ailment had rendered him so frail that he was not expected to live. Many prominent New Yorkers petitioned the governor to release Lett from prison, and Governor Silas Wright listened and had him released on March 10, 1845. His days as a terrorist over, Lett joined some of his siblings who had moved from Canada to Illinois after recovering some of his health under the care of Dr. Edward Teller in Buffalo. Edward Teller, for sure, had been involved in the bombing of the Welland Canal, so there may have been some connection there. By 1850, Lett was living in LaSalle County, Illinois, with 300 acres of land. He turned into a respectable farmer. In early December 1858, Benjamin became deathly ill during a business trip to Milwaukee possibly poisoned with strychnine by a agent of the British Crown. He died on December 9, 1858, and was buried in the family burial ground in Northville, Illinois. The inscription on his tombstone, raised by his brother Thomas, states, Benjamin Lett, the Canadian pet patriot of 1837-38, was pursued by the most powerful political party on earth, which had to stoop to perjury and poison to accomplish his destruction. The perjury was the um, attempted bombing of the SS uh, Great Britain, and the poison was the accusation of strychnine poisoning in Milwaukee. The rebellions of Upper and Lower Canada in 1837-38 played a major role in the granting of responsible government to Upper and Lower Canada. However, Benjamin Lett's acts of terrorism had no such result. While other rebels like Mackenzie and Papineau would be revered as heroes in the establishment of democracy in British North America, Benjamin Lett is mainly remembered as the miscreant who destroyed Brock's monument. So the big question is, uh, Benjamin Lett, do we look at him as a, a patriot or a terrorist? Um, Personally, I look at him as, as really neither. I look at him as some sort of uh, not totally stable person who had been brought up by his mother, who had, you know, uh, justifiable grievances, I suppose. But he had been brought up to absolutely hate a certain class of people, primarily uh, upstart militia officers and uh, rabid Tories and that sort of thing. Uh, he may have, without Mackenzie's rebellion, he may have gone ahead to commit some of these acts of terrorism, or not. It's hard to say. Um, even his, his uh, claim to be an upper Canadian patriot doesn't quite ring true. Donald McLeod, who had been one of the leaders of the patriot movement, had also been an officer during the War of 1812 and had fought alongside Brock during the War of 1812. And like anyone else who seems to have encountered Brock, absolutely revered Brock. And the whole idea that, uh, that someone would actually attack 
Brock's tomb, his final resting place, his monument on Queensland Heights, uh, put Benjamin Latt in the bad books of a lot of rebel leadership. Uh, it's interesting that his brother, Thomas, who erected the tombstone to him in Illinois, uh, chose this, this very large obelisk. It's got to be about 14 feet high. And one entire face of it, in very small text, chiseled into the stone, is this entire essay, basically, on Benjamin Lent. It's quite interesting. And uh, why his, his brother would, would uh, go to all that trouble, and, and, and you know, on a tombstone as well, Yes, it would be, would be very costly to do that when you think of uh, what you would pay the mason to do all of that. But the tombstone still stands. Um, Thomas we know very little about. He seems to have led a, a very straightforward life. Uh, he settled uh, along with his mother and family in, in Darlington Township. Um, with the rebellion of 1837-38, that seems to be where Benjamin Lutz's brothers left Upper Canada and went to Illinois, and uh, were able to pick up land in Illinois and start farming and so on. Uh, Thomas doesn't enter into the picture at all in any of my research, other than paying for and commissioning this tombstone to his brother Benjamin. Uh, but really tried to make the point that, uh, that Benjamin, on the tombstone, that Benjamin was not a terrorist, uh, was not a criminal, but was a, a patriot. So, uh, who knows? Now, often uh, dwell on the, the ironies of history. And uh, Benjamin Lett is ancestrally related to this. My great grandmother was a, a Lett. Uh, her father was a Thomas Benjamin Lett, which is kind of telling. He married a woman named Elizabeth Warren. It's exactly the same name as. Benjamin Lett's uh, mother, uh, the next generation, mind you. Uh, Benjamin Lett and I would be related, would, would share, let's say, a common ancestry back for six of my generations. Uh, the irony is that um, not only was I superintendent of Fort George for a number of years, but also was charged with um, uh, preserving Brock's monument. And uh, I also had a key to the gun powder magazine in Fort George. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know if they knew that. <laughs> they hired me the job. That's, uh, that's my presentation, so I, I welcome any questions. And, uh, well, Firing of uh, Willowbank. Uh, for all I do know, for sure, is most of my information comes from either you or Joy Lomasby. <laughs> Wouldn't be me. Huh? It wasn't me. So no. <laughs> yeah. It is that um, he had taken out insurance the year before, and so that covered the repairs. They doused the fire. He was an arsonist, and, and so. Mind you, um, Alexander was an official of the government, so in that respect, he might have any any uh, rebel, shall we say? And, and so I don't know whether it's been proven or not. It would have to be before uh, February of 1839, because that's when Alexander died. So well, it's the right time period, but as I was saying. I but I, I was, As I was saying, Benjamin Lett got blamed for, for a lot of stuff, yeah. all kinds of outrages. Uh, my guess is that Alexander burned it himself for the insurance money sure. and blamed Benjamin Lett. <laughs> Any, anyway, I mean, surely the, the uh, cold-blooded murder of anybody would be he's guilty of first-degree murder. Oh, oh, yes, I suppose so. But, uh, yeah. but Usher was... Uh, a loud, boisterous man who would uh, no doubt get up the nose of anyone who was predisposed to dislike militiamen. And um, 
had piloted the, the boat that Captain Drew was on when they cut out the Caroline. The Caroline, uh, contrary to period illustrations of it, did not go over the falls with its uh, you know steam up and uh, things coming out of its funnels and all that sort of thing. It broke up into the rapids before it reached the falls. But there was nobody on it. Quite spectacular. Nobody on it. Um, although the claim of the rebels were that there, there were a couple of men on it who had been killed going over. And, uh, this was an exaggeration to counter another jet exaggeration. It may or not be. No. Yeah. Who knows? Where would uh, both Benjamin and William Lyman Kinsey King? get the money, once they've gone to that Navy uh, island, where do they get the money to buy supplies and guns and food and all the rest of it? So I saw that these just got a lot of, you know, thick bank accounts were wrong. Go find me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, they had cell phones back then. <laughs> I, it, it's a very good question. And I suspect that, that there were people that did donate money to the cause. And um, there were a lot of things that, like with the Patriot Hunters, for example, um, they knocked over some armories in the States. But in a number of cases, the caretakers of the armory seemed to have looked the other way, through, you know, while firearms and ammunition and so on were stolen. Um, you know, the sympathetic people could feed them. That sort of thing, but I also think that they raise money through through donations uh, to support the cause. I mean, we're only a generation removed from the War of 1812, and particularly along the border uh, in New York State and that sort of thing, Buffalo in particular. There were a lot of people that still held a real grudge against the British because of the War of 1812. It's only a generation. That's subsequently because of the famine. Yes. Well, it's, it's a little late. It That's comes in 1847-48, the, the major family. So, um, you know, that's a little bit later, and, and that kind of gives rise to the Fenian Risings in the 1860s and so on. Was, was Lett a Protestant? Was he a Protestant? Lett? Oh, yeah, I think he said they were Presbyterians. Yeah. Yeah. So it was already later in the 19th century, after the, the religious revival, in both the Roman Catholic Church and the, the Protestant churches, that the division occurred in Ireland, uh, in Northern Ireland, is in an independent state now, semi-independent state, uh, on account of its Protestant majority and its refusal to be part of an Irish free state uh, as a result of the Home Rule Bill in 18, 1914. That's why I asked the question, was he a Protestant or, or a Catholic? And well, now, 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 I remember at the time, um, there weren't Protestants. Oh, yes, there were. No, no, no. no the, the Protestant, the Catholic, the Jew, and Presbyterian. That, that Protestants were Church of Ireland. Yeah. Well, so were Presbyterians. No, 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 they weren't no, called no, Protestants. No, 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 my, my grandfather having been dean of St. Patrick's Cathedral. He didn't know that. He didn't know. Well, Kerry, any other questions? I should have interrupted that. Jack? No, I, I was just. The, uh, the, the, the lion's share of the Presbyterians had come recently from Scotland. They had been transported. Uh, to, to a large extent as well. And so the they were the just, themselves, although they were Presbyterians, uh, were actually all descended from a, an officer in Cromwell's uh, army. It came from England. The Letts were from England originally. Um, there's another intriguing Let from that rebellion, again to whom I'm distantly related. A fellow named James Let, who was 15 in 1798, and uh, joined the rebels. He was from County Wexford, as the Letts and the Warrens were from County Wexford. But um, at the Battle of New Ross, the rebels were formed on a hill. The rebels always like to form on a hill. And the whole idea of forming on a hill is that if the enemy is attacking you, they'll be worn up, worn out, running up the hill. 
Uh, it also made any musketry that you had more effective firing downhill than firing up. When you fired uphill, you tended to fire too high. And also, if you had to retreat, you would be running downhill, okay, away from these exhausted guys running uphill. It made a lot of sense. So the Rebel Army gathered at New Ross in County Wexford, and uh, there was a, a, a gate that they had to attack and break through. But there was a British garrison there that had the gate pretty well covered. And they, the rebels were were arguing, the leadership were arguing and that sort of thing on the hill. Like, should we attack or shouldn't we attack? Or should we wait for reinforcements? Or how should we go about this? That sort of thing. And uh, supposedly this uh, young James Lett grabbed a banner and started racing down the hill by himself towards the gate yelling, follow me who dare. And that started the whole group rushing down into New Ross. And they captured part of the town, but were eventually defeated by the English. The survivors, including young James Lett, 15, were brought to trial. And uh, as the judge was reading the charges and, and uh, questioning each man, uh, he called out the name James Lett. And uh, the judge looked around all these rebels in chairs or captured rebels in chairs and he calls out again James Lett and he says you must stand James Lett and this little squeaky voice says I'm already standing <laughs> <laughs> no, I guess he was very short <laughs> kind, of, kind of an interesting period but the United Irishmen in 1798 was an organization that was founded by President and, uh, but they were able to recruit Catholics into the mix as well. And a promise of French aid, the French fleet was supposed to come from France and uh, not only bring arms and ammunition, but French troops to bolster the rebels. And uh, that partially happened in the west of Ireland, but it never kept counting Wexford. And, uh, the whole thing failed. Um, so another one of those Irish tales that... Uh, makes Ireland into what Sheridan called the land of happy wars and sad love songs. <laughs> I'm trying to see upstairs, are there any questions in the upper gallery? I can't see, I can see over there. Are Yes. Mark 15, direction of it. Uh, it was uh, Brock's monument. And Brock was very you said 13 years later, the new Fox Monument was done. What's the trail of Mr. Brock in 13 years? Uh, lying peacefully with uh, with John McDonnell in the vault of the first monument. So that um, it took it took 13 years till they got together enough money for their fundraising efforts to start construction of the new monument. So, as they were starting the construction of the new monument, the current monument, um, a, a Brocken and uh, McInnell were still in the old monument, and they started to take down the old monument while they were still in there. So those doing the demolition set a charge of gunpowder to basically implode the monument, have it piled down, and they used a little too much gunpowder. So then a crew was hired to clean up the debris. A lot of the debris was, uh, from the first Brock's Monument was able to be used in the current Brock's Monument. So the current Brock's Monument incorporates some of the original stones from the first monument. Other stones that they didn't have a use for, limestone blocks, were just pushed over the escarpment. But a lot of the smaller de debris and detritus was shoveled into a wagon to be taken away. And uh, one of the worthies of the town, of the area, and I can't remember who it was, uh, went to observe this happening and found that they were also shoveling bone into the wagon and uh, immediately stopped work on it. And uh, in fact, the explosion had penetrated right through the crypt and they were shoveling Brock and Matt Vanell into the wagon. So uh, as many bones as possible were retrieved, put into a couple of small boxes, basically, and buried in the Hamilton family cemetery in Queensland. 
to await the preparation of the of the new vault. And uh, so the new vault was ready to receive them, and on October 13th, 1853, they were transferred into the into the new vault. Um, and there they remain. Uh, curiously, uh, one of the local people, because we don't really have a good uh, image of Brock, that an, an honest portrait of Brock, there is a famous one based on a, on a miniature uh, that Brock sent, I think, to his sister. He had it painted in Montreal, but said it didn't look at all like him. Uh, you know, that it was a very poor portrait of him. And, and so we're not really sure what Brock looked like. So the proposal to me when I was superintendent was that we exhume Brock and MacDonnell and have uh, forensic people do uh, you know, a forensic reconstruction of Brock's face and, and then we would do it. And, of course, we didn't want to disturb the dead. He'd haunt me for the rest of my life, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, but also the very real possibility is that the, the you know that the, the skull is crushed and yeah. you may have Brock's cranium with MacDonnell's uh, jaw or something in the same box. I don't know. Um, yeah. A friend of mine who's a not a good friend, but a friend is a farm in Smithville, but by Smithville, and his ancestors originally came from Queenston. And he told me at one time that Brock was actually buried five times. Uh, the first time was very temporarily after he was killed on their farm. And I think it's the house where the tea house is. I can't think of the name of it right at the moment. It escapes me. Oh, um, it's a different place. But it, it's either there or yeah. right there. Yeah. Then, then Fort George. Not, uh, like then the monument. When the monument is destroyed. He goes back and then he goes back in for a, a fifth time to be set in the monument. So I don't know if that's true or not, but well, we do know there's no record of it except in his family lore. Yeah, we, we do know that uh, Brock's body, after shortly after he was shot, was carried to a local house. Yes. And, uh, and the battle rages on through the day, and that evening, the body is taken back to Government House uh, in, in Niagara. And behind where the courthouse is now was the Government House where Brock lived. Um, if you want to know the exact location, the town built its new washroom building over the grounds of the town. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I'm not sure, as a descendant of Lev, I should uh, go and use that washroom. <laughs> you might be considered to be doing something. <laughs> Now it's hard to believe that all this, at least a fair amount of activity was happening in that period of time. It's hard, hard, I find it very hard to get my mind around that, that was what, what early Canada was like. Yeah, yeah, and there's a lot of stories of the rebellion that uh, are not well told. I mean, we, we hear about Mackenzie on Young Street and Montgomery's Tavern and that sort of thing, but there's not an awful lot that's been said about his uh, sojourn on Navy Island. I mean, they issued paper money. And uh, it was at the Bank of the Republic of Upper Canada that issued paper money printed in Buffalo. Um, they weren't there that long. Mackenzie was on Navy Island for only a few weeks and, and issued all these proclamations and so on from there. And when the British, uh, British attacked Navy Island, they uh, uh, mustered militia and assembled them on the Canadian bank. Um, right across from Navy Island and started the bombardment of the island. But among the volunteers that uh, hastened out to join the British at Navy Island to help them fight the rebels, uh, the militia thought they would actually be doing an amphibious attack of some sort on Navy Island, but all they did was bombardment. But uh, there was a large contingent of Haudenosaunee men from Six Nations of the Grand who marched to Chippewa to join the British effort there. Um, and that's something you never really hear about. This is in 1838, and, and uh, January 1838. And usually the story of indigenous participation in the 19th century ends with the War of 1812, 
and doesn't pick up again until later in the 19th century with the Nile expedition. But, uh, but during the rebellion, indigenous people were very active, uh, you know, hauling out uh, uh, what they considered their their obligation under the Silver Covenant chain that bound them in alliance with the Korean. So there are many stories there that, um, that, that aren't really told. And among, among which is that uh, there are an awful lot of upper Canadians that uh, supported the idea of reform and uh, perhaps supported Mackenzie to a certain amount. They, they subscribed to the colonial advocate. They thought, yes, you know, we need responsible government. Uh, we need to, to be less under the thumb of the British Crown. And some who believed that they should become Republicans and join the United States. Um, but not that many actively got, into the, got, got involved in the, in the rebellion of 1837-38. Uh, the centennial remembrance of the, the erection of the monument, the re-erection, I should say. A box monument? Yes. Was there any commemoration of the re-erection? Oh, the absolutely. Years later? absolutely. So some people, Steve, might remember that. <laughs> Do you? Oh, I'm sorry. You're saying on the on the anniversary of the hundredth anniversary because there is a, there's a a, a a habit of hundredth anniversaries in our time being memorialized. Yeah. Such as the War of 1812, the, the Paris Peace Conference in our own time. And I'm just trying to find I'm, in the I'm totally unaware of any celebration on the hundredth anniversary. Yeah. Of, you know. Um, whether in, in uh, at any time during the 1950s or the kind of anniversary time. But uh, no. No, the Battle of Queens and Heights is, is commemorating. Well, yes. Well, but I think the raising right. of a monument may be less, uh, you know, less important in people's minds. Well, and you were saying that there were a lot of the uh, upper Canadians, so called establishment, who were in favor of reform of the government, but oh, not yeah. revolution. In other words, uh, Alexander Hamilton's eldest brother, Robert Jr., in the Hamilton D. Cornwall House, oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, named his third daughter Jane Gourlay Hamilton. After Robert Gourlay. Yes. And, and <laughs> Thorpe. Was it Thorpe? Who was another reform, would be reformer in the early. Well, Gourlay wrote something called the Statistical Survey of Upper Canada. She was very critical of the of the government at the time yeah. and very pro reform. Yes. Um, yeah, but I, you know, just an example, another example of, of sort of a misconception of, of whether or not Upper Canada was right for rebellion. And this this becomes part of it is that um, in November eighteen thirty eight, the rebels and Patriot hunters invaded near Prescott and occupied this, this stone grist mill, a windmill. And in the four-day battle of the windmill, they were surrounded by local militia and eventually forced to surrender. And um, the leader of that, a fellow named Niels von Schultz, and I think 11 other patriots or hunters were strung up from the ramparts of Fort Henry. They were tried. And incidentally, the lawyer for Niels von Schultz at his trial was a young attorney from Kingston named John A. McDonald. And he lost that case. <laughs> but um, the, uh, the flag that the rebels at the Battle of the Windmill flew from the top of the windmill was uh, emblazoned, liberated by the Patriot hunters. And that's how it was seen by many as that these invasions of Upper Canada by the Patriot hunters were seen as um, armies of liberation, that they would arrive and that the Canadian people yeah. would flock to their banner and together they would throw off the bonds of British rule and establish the, the Republic of Upper Canada. So it was a huge mistake in thinking that Upper Canadians were right for rebellion. Mackenzie made the same mistake. Exactly the same mistake was made during the War of 1812. In 1812, 1813, and 1814, the Americans firmly believed that all they had to do was send an army 
into Lower Canada or Upper Canada, and that the local people would come and join them, and together they would defeat the British. Now, what they didn't realize during the War of 1812, and what they didn't realize during the Rebellion, and what they didn't realize in the 1860s with the Fenian Raid, and they thought the same thing, that Irish Americans would attack British North America, and Irish Canadians would join their banner. What they didn't realize is that Canadians have three basic hobbies. Uh, hockey, the weather, and bitching about government. <laughs> and, you know, that, that people complained about government so much that it was natural that anyone from outside who was not Canadian would think that we were right for rebellion. But every time the crunch came, as at the Battle of the Windmill, the local militia flocked to the British banner to, to defeat these, uh, these invaders, these filibusters who were coming in to upset the status quo. And as soon as the rebel rebellion was defeated, everyone went back to complaining about government. <laughs> Is it known uh, that it's high tide that Uh, how many rebels were there? Right. Is that? On the That's a good question because there were a lot of a lot of gatherings. Um, um, for example, at one point in Malone, New York, they held a rally, and there were some six hundred Patriot hunters who showed up at the rally. Many of them armed with their pistols and Bowie knives and muskets and that sort of thing, and. Uh, uh, it really came to naught. It, it, uh, you know, they, they, maybe while the drink was flowing, you know, they, they spoke a good rebellion, but, uh, but it never actually panned out. So um, the largest invasions may have involved 250, 300 men. I mean, at Navy Island, Mackenzie never assembled more than a couple of hundred men. So it wasn't, it wasn't huge, it wasn't widespread, or it wasn't coordinated. It was kind of widespread. I mean, there were attacks at Windsor, um, along the Detroit frontier. The, the group established at Navy Island, uh, the St. Lawrence River, and of course in Lower Canada and Quebec as well, coming up from Vermont and New York. There, again, there were attacks by by Patriot hunters, but they never amounted to it. So, so what were the British doing at this point in time in Canada that would cause people to want to rebel? Uh, I'm sorry that uh, what, what was what was happening in, uh, in here at that time? Oh, the, the, what, what, what sort of government was were the British oh, okay. proposing that would cause people to rebel? Okay, well, it, uh, there was an appointed governor and an executive council and a legislative council that advised advised the government, but um, there was no sort of universal suffrage. You had to own property worth a certain amount to to be enfranchised to vote. And of course women couldn't vote and, and, uh, and so on. But um, uh, they didn't feel that the well, when they knew that the governors of both Lower Canada, Upper Canada, and the Governor General, uh, none of them were accountable to the electorate. You know, that, that uh, they felt that they were being ruled as a colony rather than a as a, a problem. So no legislature as we would know. <laughs> yeah, a little different, but they, they could vote money bills. So they could kind of stymie the executive council, but the executive council and the governor could overturn any law that, that had been passed by the legislatures. There was no real power in the legislature. Is that called the family compact? Yes, in Upper Canada it was called the family compact because when you actually, it is quite interesting, when you do the genealogy, you see that almost every single leader in Upper Canada, in, in, in government, was uh, related through marriage or, or through blood. So it really was a family compact. Um, those who weren't related by blood or whatever had something in common. They had all been to uh, school run by, by uh, Reverend John Strong. Who was that? A rabid Tory. Uh, so, so yes, it was a family, like a ruling clique. And in fact, the same thing was in Lower Canada. 
And in Lower Canada, they referred to the government as the Chateau Peak. And that's an appropriate name. But uh, the risings were to try and uh, uh, push more of a democratic thing, more of a more democracy, more representation in Parliament. Um, you know, and, and it's something that had been spurred on by a number of things, and one of them was Jacksonian democracy in the United States. That uh, What was happening in Upper Canada was very influenced by what was happening politically in the United States. And uh, uh, first Jefferson and then Andrew Jackson were really pushing for more enfranchisement of the little guy in America, and uh, that really caught on in British North America as well. Not only in Upper and Lower Canada, but in the Maritimes as well, the push for responsible government. And eventually it would come. I mean, that's one thing that, that the rebellion did, was it stirred the British to send Lord Durham to Upper Canada to study the political, study the war, what was going on there. And with his recommendations, um, they established responsible government in Upper Canada. It would take a while before it was more universal enfranchisement, but, but it did come. So, uh, I'm good for two more questions. Rob, could you give me the date of the Allenberg bombing against the Nixon? No, it's, it's uh, later than that. It's, um, you know, it's a funny thing with with memory, I worked so long in the war of 1812 that I can tell you the exact date, year, and often the time that something happened during the war of 1812. Um, children's birthdays, or when did we buy that fridge, completely escapes me. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was eighteen. Uh, I think it was eighteen January. Yeah, that's the date. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Forty-one, September 9th, eighteen forty. 